Welcome again. We're back, right? We're back. Shout out to y'all. We're back for our second edition, our second episode of Sunday School, and we're live from the Blue Room. Give it up. We do have folks in studio. You can hear them on camera, so we're just not digital. We're coming at you live, but we are here today doing another fundraiser because we're trying to bring a guaranteed basic income to North Nashville, and what we're going to do is we're going to pilot what it looks like to disrupt poverty for 100 families that are struggling with poverty in North Nashville. So if you're so moved throughout any of this, please donate. This is a fundraiser, so donate, because the only way we're going to do it is if you give. So you might be asking yourself, how can we disrupt poverty using a guaranteed basic income? And that is in three ways. One, moving Nashville forward will create a pilot that invests in North Nashville over one year. These pilots are popping up across the country because of last year, we know the effects of unrestricted cash. We know how they can help benefit people. But the difference here in North Nashville is we're doing grassroots fundraisers like this to make sure that the people own the fundraiser too. What are we gonna do? We're gonna track the impact of that guaranteed basic income from that 100 families with researchers that do this for a living, y'all. And then three, we're gonna publish our findings, very similar to the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration, and we're gonna use that publishing, which we call the 37208 demonstration, to provide a roadmap to other communities so that we can not only do this in North Nashville, hopefully we can do this across Nat Davidson County and across Tennessee so we can really disrupt poverty for everyone struggling with poverty, not only in Nashville, but across Tennessee. But before we get started, before we get started, we have a lot of great things planned for you. We have a great conversation. I want to introduce an amazing talent that I'm super excited that is going to bless us with her talents, youth, U.S. Poet Laureate Ambassador and published author. Check the book out. What would you say if you could? It, I am so proud to be able to introduce Harvell Havilit Whiting. Give it up for it. Give it up for Havilit Whiting. Give it up. Hi, I'm Haviland. Um, I want to introduce my first poem. It's called The Legacy of Harm. What we know about trauma, like healing, is that it's not linear. It affects not only those who experienced a traumatic event directly, but also everyone around them. The South has its own role to play in traumatizing children, be it through sharecropping, slavery, or indentured servitude. It is important to understand and teach generational trauma because events that occurred 150 years ago still affect people today. I wrote this poem after hearing that Mr. Bill Lee passed a ban on teaching slavery and black history in Tennessee classrooms. I believe it is important that we all understand the legacy of harm. So here goes. The heat in Tennessee is like that of an iron furnace. The hottest days of the year are spent lingering under willow trees. Boys dangle their feet from the branches, a heat so deep it makes the marrow in your bones run dry. And in the swamp bobs an old canoe, splintered from traveling, a lone woman floats, her headscarf untangling and giving shelter to the frogs. It's the hottest day, we all just trying to cool off. And a warning whistle from a steaming pot in the big white house full of small black souls brews a sweet tea. The sugar dancing, 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 and then melting, the crystals formed and bobbed and then disappeared. The woman's swollen perfume attracted onlookers from all corners to stand and gawk and wail and kneel. Freedom, a low-hanging fruit. Dripping blood to the roots on a tree, little boys swing on. Mouths hanging open in a permanent grin, eyes like iron wells. Tennessee ain't a place for those who love color. You got red and black and green, the stinking swollen sugar, the scent of a girl who has just reached puberty, a sweet movement of tall grasses and soft hair. She'll be pregnant by the next summer. A baby with hair so fine and eyes so light, the mistress of the bright white house will turn her bright white hate over with the tea on the girl's hands, the scars twining up her arms like bent over trees. A somber song spreading through the fields like waving corn, smooth like fine, fine, loose silk. It is the hottest day of the year and the Harpeth River Valley is hot with the running of a hundred feet under the blooming promise of night. The mulberry trees hang, dropping fruit and fruit and ugly, ugly leaves that crunch and call and give way to the rounded end of a pistol that impregnates the silence as it empties its contents and leaves the forest sweating. 
Blood at the roots which stinks into the soil from whence my bones grew like a stillborn child, surrounded by the last sacred thing a black woman may offer. The sky is a smoky gray and I still know how to find the glowing North Star. The beat of a thumping heart echoes in my feet. Women in my family learn how to run when the shore is no longer safe, when home is a dangling appendage and we trail our phantom limbs. It was the hottest day of the year. If a girl is taken from her mother's womb and her honey is left to pool in her shoes, it is only the hottest day of the year. If a man has disappeared into the forest and swallowed back into the carnivorous soil, it is only the hottest day of the year. And if I write a poem about slavery and how my back still harbors a scar, how my legs have nightmares of being pried open, how my bones ache with the stories of millions, how a woman of color may expect violence at the hands of her lover and a man may fear the corner store at night, and the road home is filled with lined weeping trees red with blood, if I write a poem about the events that could have destroyed us, left us singing lullabies to our drowned babies, our raped mothers, our burned fathers, if I write a eulogy to a people that should have choked on water hoses and gasoline and cinder block cells and smoke and the crack of the cocaine and the whip and the stifling heat of poverty and Katrina Maria and Trump, if I write a poem about forced abortions and a fear of open water and leaving school at 12 years old because a period brings fingers scratching the insides of a young girl, it is fast approaching the coldest day of the year where the sky is milky and frozen, a proper Tennessee winter. And if I am reading a poem in front of a room full of people who look like those who drowned and gasped and wailed and moaned and bled and lost and ran, then isn't that a testament to the strength of my city? That we are all still standing, eyes wide and searching, betting on losing dogs with every scent. Okay, um, so I wrote this second poem actually a few days ago in a taxi ride I took out to Antioch, and um, it just came to me as I was talking to my cab driver. Um, it's called Sweet Blood. The South is not the place to have sweet blood in May. The weeping willows hang long and low, a consistent hum from the telephone wire, a bee sting rising like fresh cake batter. Sweet blood is the reason my cab driver said he's leaving Tennessee. Going back to Chicago to a neighborhood where bullets are fired through shotgun shacks like last month's stimulus, he tells me the bugs down here are too much for his sweet blood. He rubs his skin with his palm and says, I got a lot of Indian in me. I don't get dark, I get red. I bite my tongue, drawing out sour blood. The highway is long and winding. 440 has been under construction since I was a little girl, and now the heat is rising off the pavement like a funeral pyre as I consider the generational purging of sweet blood from my city. He says he's leaving because his mom was meant to come down with his little cousin and they were going to have a cookout, but the house over the highway is turning into a gym or something and, well, it just seems time for him to go home. Must be the Indian in him. Pushed out the south yet again, burning sanctuaries, brand new Starbucks, must be the Indian in him. Uprooted from family, led back over that highway, this ain't no battle cry to the forgotten and the fallen to gather on our holy knees and weep. We have given elbows and teeth and skin to this city. We have given the city our lungs. Family have laid their monuments to love, laid down their open arms and surrendered, erected their statues and tried to cut them down. Watch the city bleed out soul. Watch the city bleed out Buena Vista Heights and Case Place. Bring out sweet cornbread and fried okra. Bring telephone wires and early June sunrises. Must be that sweet blood in me that turns coal when a restaurant replaces that old family funeral home. It must be that southern charm keeping me coming back to Tennessee. Nashville is like a first love. You can't help but watch how he changes, how he forgets you with the seasons, trying out new neighborhoods like a cheap dinner date, leaving you with the bill. Must be the red in my father's skin that keeps him going back to that community center between Charlotte and Fisk, dancing on the precipice of being forgotten. Humming barely above a whisper, these dilapidated walls still sing. I get dark in the summer. This southern summer, he bakes me like pot pie, and I return back to gardens that were once churches and homes that are now grocery stores lined and stacked with goodness that the neighborhood can't even afford. Must be the black in my skin that keeps me going back to the Edge Hill Library, touching the bricks, counting the days, slicing my fingertips on yellowed pages. I sharpen my pencils. I sharpen my tongue. I will write about everyone who loved here first. Thank you so much. Y'all give, give it up for Haviland. Y'all give it up for Haviland. Y'all give it up for Haviland. And thank you. Thank you for blessing us with your talent. That was beautiful. Next up, we have a great conversation coming straight 
from the Blue Room, once again, last week we really talked about how and why we need a guaranteed basic income and left that historical groundwork because we're going to ground ourselves in history. But we're right back to it again today, and we have two great guests, both very, very connected to North Nashville and the issues that we're talking about, poverty. Um, so the first question is name, pronoun, and what brought you here? So my name is Jamel Kamagooch. My pronouns are he, him, his. And what brought me here? North Nashville. I love it, you know? And I'm really hoping that we can raise enough money through this, through all of the things that we're trying to do to get a guaranteed basic income for families that are struggling with poverty in North Nashville. So I'm gonna kick it to you first. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nadira Freeman, and what brings me here today is the work that I do with the Nashville Economic Justice Alliance, which we also call NESIA. Um, I've worked different jobs since I've been in Nashville, and organizing was one where I was doing community organizing and parent organizing, and that was in the North Nashville area. And one of the things that that taught me is that I, don't understand everybody else's experience. And although I have my own struggles, um, it looks different for different people. And so it's really important to engage the people that you're saying you're trying to create solutions for and what are their actual needs, rather than saying I have great ideas and this is what I'm gonna do to you and or for you without their input. So that's one of the things that brings me to this work around a guaranteed basic income because that's the way Nisha approached the work. By going into communities, by talking about what a guaranteed basic income is because it was a foreign concept really prior to our last election when you started hearing people talk about it more. And then with a pandemic and COVID-19, we hear even more about a guaranteed basic income under the auspice of relief because of the need that people across the nation had. So when we talk specifically about 37208, we know that there are great needs because of historical transactions that have left them displaced and underserved and so I from a policy standpoint want to see how can we address this with viable solutions and from an organizing standpoint how do we engage people in like fixing their communities, aiding their communities, empowering their communities. And then from an organizational standpoint, like how do we work together to make sure that we're doing what's in the best interest for our own communities? And so if I, if I give a quick definition on um, guaranteed basic income, it is really meeting the need. And if you ask why, it is a direct action to eradicate poverty. And when I was first introduced to it, I, my main question was like, how, how? Like, we don't really have money for that. How, how are you gonna do it? But when you look at the things that we do find money for and we do fund, and then when you talk about how much we're actually talking about, which is pennies in comparison to a city budget, we can find the money to do it if we prioritize it and if we understand the impact that it'll have. So I love how everybody, you know, you know, we say Dr. King was amazing, he was a genius. You know, what a peacemaker, what a change agent. And all of those things are true. I hate how we piecemeal and pick and choose right, right. what he said that we want to agree with. So right. either the man was a genius or not. Right. And so Dr. King, you know, was, was transformational and saying like, this is something that we can do. We have the resources to eradicate poverty in America. This is not a natural situation. It is a man-made situation. And so, King had dreams, and yes, he wanted little black girls and little white girls and little black boys and little white girls to join hands and skip and play, but he also had an economic dream, and that was the government needs to provide monetary funds to Americans, and then that will be a direct action, again, a direct action to eradicate poverty. We can create all the programs that we want to. We can provide supplements and this, that, and other, and they help. We're not going to say that, but this is another other option that has a great impact because then people have the decision and they are empowered to make changes in their own lives and support their own families, which is what at the end of the day is what dignity looks like. Sure, y'all give it up. Y'all give it up for that answer right there. That's what I'm talking about right there. That sounds amazing. Dr. Williams, you want to answer that question too? Uh, name, pronoun, and what brought you here? Yeah. Name is LaRotha Williams Jr. I'm associate professor of African American and Public History at Tennessee State University. 
I'm also the coordinator of the North Nashville Heritage Project. This was a project that began in 2010, and it emerged as a result of a tour that we were given of Jefferson Street. Um, um, recently departed Kwame Lillard gave my class and my colleague, Dr. David Paget class, so he gave us a tour of Jefferson Street. So we walked from roughly about 12th Avenue North all the way to TSU. And you know, it was kind of rough on me because I'm a little bit older <laughs> than my students, right? That's a long walk too, Dr. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the next time we met, we gathered to just to, just to talk about what we had seen and what we had heard. And um, we talked a lot about Jefferson Street, and this is something that much of the city still celebrates to this day. Um, we talk about it being a business center, a cultural center. Everybody talks about the, the great guitar battle that occurred at, at Club Baron, right? But then one of my students said, well, Dr. Williams, what about those other streets? What about Hyman Street? What about Scoville Street? What about Jackson Street? Yet people living there, how were they doing? And um, being a savvy professor, I said, well, we will find out together. So this project began, and, and, and what I tried to do is just to push my students to talk to their relatives, to their uncles, and aunties, and mama them. And mama them is a word, right? Um, talk to them and see what they remember about this space. But then we pushed a little bit further. We wanted to look at that space from the moment James Robertson pulled up here in a barge and said, okay, this looked like a good place to settle uh -huh. to the week before last. Uh -huh. And in the process of doing so, we, we've, we reached the conclusion that African Americans have been here since day one. Uh -huh. We've been long-term residents of this city. But if you look around, you got to conclude that oftentimes we are the most unwelcomed or the, the, the most abused of all of the residents. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do at TSU is to chronicle the history of the community, being mindful of the places that we need to celebrate, but other areas that we need to explore. And I think with this project, it's... it's it's caused us to ask better questions about the city's relationship with the community. Um, as was said earlier, we find money for what we want to find money for in right. the city. Right. Um, what I've, I've, I've learned and what our students have come to realize that is that none of the stuff we see in North Nashville occurred by accident. Right. Um, housing is not bad because the folks that live there want to live in bad housing, right? Um, you didn't have a food desert. I know it's doing a little bit better now, just a little bit. Right. But um, these, these folks didn't settle in spaces that didn't have grocery stores because they wanted to be challenged in finding food. And uh, the health issues that we find in North Nashville, um, these folks are not there because they, they maybe don't care as much about health or don't care as much about their children and so forth. So with this project, um, it's, it's caused us to look at the community, but more importantly, to look at the city of Nashville as a whole and how it treats um, not only the African-American community, but those that they might deem to be um, the least in their society. So North Nashville, the North Nashville Heritage Project is a lens that we use to view the relationship of African-Americans with the city of Nashville. And, and um, I'm pleased that it started out as, as you know, when I put this thing together, I thought it might last maybe a year, maybe two. And it's 2022 now, we're still dealing with um, an effort to 
discern the history, to uncover the history, to think about new ways to celebrate the history. Right. But we're also noticing that some of the problems that we observed has gotten worse. Right. And this is what brings me to this conversation today. I'm a professor, but I'm here to learn. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, 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 and we talked about this last week, how we want to ground ourselves in history and context, because like what was just mentioned, the issues that we're struggling with in North Nashville are, were intentional, right? Um, and it has a lot to do, a lot to do with the context of what Jefferson Street was like right before the interstate was built, right? So you should be getting a slide up on your screen right now. And if we can just talk about both what you all know about Jefferson Street before um, the interstate was built, if you could just talk about it like very briefly. I know Dr. Williams just kind of got into it, but if you could just talk about the power that was in North Nashville directly before the interstate was built. Um, thank you for the question. I um, oftentimes try to put a date as to when you know, Jefferson Street began to cultivate the relations, the, the sort of reputation that it has right now. And I, um, and this is the gospel according to Williams here, and I know the folks at Fisk and, and, and TSU <laughs> are gonna get upset with me. Um, but when Meharry comes here, right about 1930, that's when things really start to jump. Even though there's a concerted effort to get black people to move to this area, I mean, right after slavery ends, and then when TSU and Hadley Park opens up. You see an effort to get people there, but it's during 1930, that's when Jefferson Street really starts to jump. We had a cotton club in North Nashville that was adjacent to Jefferson Street, and, and you could go there on Sunday night, as a matter of fact, and you might catch Lionel Hampton or some other jazz great. But then when you start thinking about, you got these professors and, 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 and doctors that are moving here and they want goods and they want services and they like to get entertained, mm -hmm. then the, 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 the business aspect of it really takes off. Mm -hmm. But the thing to remember also is that the relationship between Jefferson Street and North Nashville in general and those three institutions were very profound, it was intimate. Mm -hmm. TSU used to have its homecoming during Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking about the economic impact of right. that on the community. Right. Because you know, you go there, you get your, get your suit or your dress and you get out there and you profile and you have a good time. So, um, and then with the students, I imagine them hooking up with families, right. um, getting to the point to where they're seeing this space is not just a space to get an education, but a, a space to connect. But I think one aspect of it um, is that when we look at Jefferson Street, you gotta look at Jefferson Street as a stage upon which this the, the Nashville movement played out. One of the most important events in this city's history, and I humbly submit to you, Jamel, that it was just as important as when Robertson and Donaldson them showed up, right? Right, right. Um, it was April 19th when Z. Alexander Luby's house was bombed by terrorists. Right. That march that took place, took place on Jefferson Street. It began at TSU mm -hmm. and it ended up at the, 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 um, at the downtown at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. When you start thinking about that, you're like, wow, events have transpired there that have changed how we define democracy and equality. For sure. And I and I think and I think we had this photo up. We just had this photo up. But that's why like I wanted to make sure like both our viewers can see what plays out when the interstate is driven through all of that culture and all of that history, right? Is if you're looking at your screen right now, what you're seeing is a photo of businesses being evicted because the city decided to drive an interstate directly through North Nashville, essentially displacing that historic hub of culture, that power that we just talked about. And 
really ending, really dead ending North Nashville all the way together, right? Which is creating the conditions that we experienced it before. And I know Nadira kind of spoke on the poverty piece and the economic deprivation that was caused before, I mean, that was caused by the interstate. And I think we also have another slide that just straight up shows you how Jefferson Street was straight up just connected before the interstate. Um, but I think it's also important to realize it wasn't just businesses. It was people's homes. Yes. Like, it wasn't yep. just a commercial district. It was residential as well. And that's where my connection, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, Do you think? Jump um, in anytime. To Jefferson Street begins because my family um, is actually one of the only owner and occupied like residents of Nashville's Jefferson Street. Um we're right next to Shampoo Perry, right across the street from the on-ramp to the interstate. And so it is my grandparents' great-grandmother, my great-great-grandparents and my great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother um, bought the house together. So it was a familial house from the beginning. And so my grandmother was raised in that house. She raised her children in that house. Mm -hmm. Currently, my cousin lives there. She's raised her children in the house. We just graduated our last two. My daughter just graduated and her son just graduated. Congratulations. So it's been generations upon generations of generations being on Jefferson Street. And so the stories that, um, you know, I've been able to hear about, you know, and this is even from my mom's generation, not even going that far back, where they had a full front yard. It really was one day I was looking at some pictures and I was like, well, whose house is this? And they were like, that's the house on Jefferson Street. I was like, no, it's not. Like, look at the front yard. It was like, you know, snow on the ground, all this stuff. And I was like, this is not. And then like, literally they were like, no, this is what the house used to look like. This is who lived right across the street. We can talk about the neighbors and the family who lived literally all across like where the interstate is right now, how they would walk to school, how they would walk to church because the church is not that far. It's on Albion. Um, they went to Pearl High. Um, and so when you had that interstate come through, and in my family, they're fist guys. I have some families, uh, members from Tennessee State as well, but just the disruption of everyday life and accessibility. Um, and when you talked about grocery stores, like there were grocery stores, there were like little mom and pop stores and you started seeing those dissipate. So it wasn't even just about like the commercial spaces, but it was really people's homes and their legacies. Because again, you remember for black people, what do we do? We buy houses and we consider it at our wealth. For sure. We pass down this property to the next generation. And so for that, it was upended. And a lot of, and because I, I asked, I was like, does anybody kind of know what happened when families moved? And some of those stories just, you know, they're not bright, to be honest. Not at all. And, and, and one thing you learn about when you're growing up in North Clashville, because I grew up right on Clay Street, is all the dead ends. And I remember thinking like, these dead ends can't be natural. And it took me going to another city and seeing how cities are gridded out and realizing like, okay, something had to happen here. Even around Pearl Cone, when you go there, it's like a large roundabout that just sends you all the way around the community instead of like cutting straight through. So it's just like interesting, because I think we have another slide on how North Nashville was just like straight up essentially dead. And I think it was something like 50 streets ended up being dead in it. And I know my mom talks about it often, being able to walk all over the place and then literally not being able to do that anymore, like at all. So if either one of you can just like talk about what you think community members had to be feeling or just like how that plays out now. I, um, I'm originally from Tallahassee, Florida. I'm not from Nashville. So I, when, I, when I arrived here, I had to talk to some of the seniors about what used to be here. Um, met a gentleman at um, J.T. Smith's Barbershop who grew up in North Nashville. So it's like, okay, I told him what I was working on. And he said, well, I'll show you around. So we would meet at Harper's and you know, eat a little chicken. And then we'd get in this truck and we'd drive around. I said, okay, where did you live? And he took me over to 12th Avenue North. So if you can imagine going down Jefferson and making that right on 12th Avenue North. And I said, okay, where was your house? I'm looking out the passenger side window, right? He's like, no, I lived over there. And I looked over to my left and all I saw was a chain link fence and I-40. And it dawned on me immediately that 
you know, the, that interstate had all but erased the built environment and the memory of those people. So I said, Mr. Fanroy, where did those people go? He said, I don't know, they're just gone. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about that, uh, my next thing I did was I looked at 12th Avenue North and then also looked at the 2400 block of Jefferson Street, right where the interstate um, intersects. And it intersected in that community in two spaces is another conversation we can have. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of homeowners lived along that strip. Yep. And so when you start thinking about home ownership as being a source of wealth, you know, that's gone. Even if the city or the state scratched out a check for those folks, that money's no longer in North Nashville. For sure. Um, and, and I was cognizant of the dead ends mm -hmm. as well. But as a historian, when I look at what transpired, um, you see the displacement of a community. You mm -hmm. see the removal of a community. You mm -hmm. see wealth being shipped out of a community. And then when you read the record, you see that the folks that were removed, the people that were directly impacted by it, really didn't have as much say as they should have. Right. So right. decisions were made that affected them um, that if they found out about it, they found out about it at the last minute. They found out about it when somebody was sticking a fence up in front of their front yard. Right, and I think, and I think if I can hop in real fast, I know both of you have kind of queued up that there's very intentional poverty that was created in North Nashville. So I'm curious, I know guaranteed basic income is something that we can do to directly, a direct action, I think is what you said before, in the dear, a direct action against that poverty that exists there. So what's the steps as we, as we come down the finish line? What are the steps in restoring community members that are in North Nashville and those that have been displaced? So I think when we start talking about solutions and restorations, it does come down to economics. Um, and a lot of times we get a lot of the symbolism and we get you know the celebra celebratory and the commemorative, but we don't get down to the economics of it. So yes, guaranteed economic Ec guaranteed basic income is also an economic um, resource, right? But it's also important to talk about, if we're talking about racial justice, then, so even after for interstate and all this, that for black people, and we're talking about black people because we're talking about North Nashville, that there has been an exclusion of black people and being able to access resources um, and opportunities to build wealth or to access capital to redevelop land that they might have. And, and, and again, the historian, we were kind of talking about over there about banking practices, right? And the difference between who can get a loan and who can't get a loan. If I have a great business idea and I want to start a business on Jefferson Street, what hoops am I going to have to jump through to even start a business in my own community? So I think when we start looking at the economics of it and how do we empower a people who are already on a path to wanting to do great things for their own families and for their communities and then for those who need an extra boost, right? Then how do we come in and what kind of information needs to be shared? What kind of resources need to be made available? Um, because I think at this point, and I'm not saying this because I don't love murals. I love murals. I yeah. love art. I love what the community looks like with the addition of all these beautiful black faces when I yep. drive down the street. And that's important. Yep. However, I also want to see where the money at, right. <laughs> where the cash at, <laughs> and how are we distributing it amongst ourselves in our community, mm -hmm. which is another conversation to be had. But also, how are we able to direct you know, these resources in our community to be able to take ownership to say, this is what we want to happen. And that's, I think a lot of times if you go to community meetings and stuff like that, black people are just tired of feeling like everything is happening to them, right? right? right. This development is happening to me. It's right. happening on my back. Right. And so how do we like change the framework and create space where we acknowledge, okay, like y'all, this is your community. Like, what do we need to do to help you guys? You know, what can we do to rectify some of the things that previously have happened that might've negatively impacted? And then um, the community taking ownership and say like, right, this is our community and this is what we see, ha we want to see happen. And here's the avenue with which we're gonna use to pursue that. 
No, no, I think that's important. Like you said, I think all of that is important, especially being because it was intentionally harmed. So being intentional about solving it very specifically. But Dr. Williams, did you want to get in on a on an answer to that question? Like, what's a step into restoring North Nashville from the historical trauma that it has experienced? Hey, um, you know, the city was complicit in its destruction, so it should take an active role in rebuilding it. Um, two examples, and I'm saying this with a caveat because I, I love baseball, right? Um, but we have a magnificent baseball stadium down at the end of Jefferson. Yep. I mean, people go there and they have big fun, and I'm one of them. Um, when I when I was going to the barbershop, I sat next to plumbers, brick masons, um, people that could have done that work, but they couldn't even get a seat at the table. And there's reasons for that. And 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 you know, my father builds houses back in Tallahassee, so I kind of feel like the game is rigged anyway. Um, but for those folks that needed to be bonded, they should be able to get some assistance in doing that from the city. I might be a small time plumber and I can, you know, I can go in there and hook up 30 toilets. I can do that, no problem. But I can't demonstrate that I can make payroll maybe two weeks down the road or a month down the road. Um, I envision a situation where the city might create an environment where a group of plumbers can get together and work on one of these million dollar projects. You know, they go there, they do the work, and then on the back end they get paid, but there's, there's something else that they can say that they have experience at working on these big projects. So next time I might not need a group, I can do it myself. Um, but I think that's gonna take some radical thinking, some determination, some some vision, if you will, for mm -hmm. that to transpire. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, we, um, I think this will be the next step to the guaranteed income. You know, mm -hmm. you got the guaranteed income, but um, I'm doing something that I can take to Edge Hill or mm -hmm. out east. Mm -hmm. I could do the same thing there. So mm -hmm. that's... Um, you know, those are some of the things that I think about. For sure. And that, and that greater change and that greater restoration is why we're here today. Once again, if you feel moved by anything you've heard, please donate to Moving Nashville Forward. We are the only pilot in the country that is attempting to do this in a way where the folks of Nashville can actually own it by donating to us. So please donate to us. But before we move on, please give a hand clap for our illustrious guest here. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. So, next up, next up, we have a performance by the Shandellas, and it's going to be amazing. But before we go there, we have a very short animated video that are going to teach, that we're going to use, Moving Nashville Forward, and some other organizers on the ground are going to use to actually teach all of our folks about what a guaranteed basic income is, because it is very important, like Nadira said, that we bring our people along while we're doing it. So we're going to cue that up for you. Sit back, relax. The next thing you're going to see is a beautiful performance by the Chandelas. North Nashville is Nashville's soul. And Nashville dead ended it when it built Interstate 40 through its heart. Moving Nashville forward is launching a guaranteed basic income pilot to disrupt poverty in our city starting in the 37208 zip code, North Nashville, where we can begin to address this harm. The interstate permanently scarred and isolated the area. 80% of Black-owned businesses in Nashville closed as a result, devastating it economically and creating the conditions of poverty there today. North Nashville has an average income of less than half of Nashville's living wage. Families are struggling with the impact of decades of over-policing, the aftermath of a tornado, and rapid gentrification. They lack access to jobs that pay a living wage, healthcare, and social services. 
we can change this by investing in the people of North Nashville. Like similar experiments in this country and around the world, the 37208 demonstration will offer direct cash transfers and track their impact on people and the community. For a family living in poverty, this means the ability to pay bills on time, to put food on the table, and to keep young people off the streets. It means the ability to plan for the future. With enough resources and support, we can begin to end poverty, starting in North Nashville. The 37208 demonstration will make North Nashville and Davidson County a model for a more prosperous future. Our findings will provide a roadmap to repeating this experiment and a plan to create more equitable cities. We can disrupt poverty in North Nashville and restore Nashville's soul. Support the 37208 demonstration by donating today. of stealing my shine soon as i turn my back then out comes the knife hey don't underestimate what they'll do for fame ain't no secret that these shady people will say anything for money anything yeah Lies you control to get to your pockets, they will snatch out your soul. Hey, uh, laughing and smiling while they're twisting the truth. Ain't no secret that these greedy people will do anything for money. Anything, anything, anything. Yeah! 
thing. What matters is helping our communities thrive. What matters is our tribe. What matters is real love. Thank you guys. Thank you all. And thank you Chuck Harmony for playing on keys with us today. And Derek Green on percussion. Uh, and moving Nashville forward, Sunday school, what a concept. Absolutely. And we've learned so much already today. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's just take a breath. <sighs> because life is crazy, but how blessed are we that we have the opportunity to do something good. So today we're doing something really important. We are raising one million dollars, one million dollars for 100 families in North Nashville. What a beautiful thing. So if you haven't already, wherever you are in the world, thank you for being here with us. Go ahead and donate whatever you can. No amount is too small, no amount is too large. What a blessing to be a blessing. What a blessing. We have one more song to do today, but we should probably introduce ourselves, yes, huh? Hey, I'm Casey. I'm Stacy. And I'm Tam. And, and we, we are, are the Shindellas.
wish is my and confuse me But I'm here to tell you that we're not afraid Oh, get out my way Cause I'm on a mission, don't mess with my vision I'm doing my best to grow every day So get out my way Make sure you give it up for them one more time, one more time, one more time. Y'all almost made me turn into a rapper for a quick second. I'm not going to lie. I was out there bouncing. I was out there bouncing. So give it up for the Chandelas one more time. I need you to get live. Give it up for Haviland who came and blessed us with some words. Give it up for our two guests, Dr. Dr. Williams and the Dear Freeman Community Organizer. Give it up, 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 give it up. So we're almost done. We're going to see you back here next month. Also, check us out on our social. Follow us, Nashville FWD, for some updates. Also, we're having a fundraiser, so move your friends on June 10th. But you got to make sure you follow us next, the last Sunday of next month. We're right back at you talking about getting a guaranteed basic income to North Nashville. Talking about getting a million dollars to 100 families. So we're looking forward to doing this again. Hopefully we can all snap a picture. Make sure you follow us. But yeah, send us out with a shout. Hand claps, hand claps, hand claps, hand claps. Shout out to Third Man. Yeah, let's do this again soon.